am so excited about tonight's lecture, and I, and we, I think we booked this about a year ago, so we've been waiting for it and, and, and are very excited. Brian Vega was born in England and has been sailing and working powerboats since he was eight years old. An archaeologist by profession, he is Emeritus Professor of Anthropology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he has taught for 36 years, since he was very little. Uh, he is internationally known for his more than 50 books and numerous articles on archaeology written for the general public. I, I did say 50 books. That's more books than I've read when I was an English major. Um, incredible. Uh, Brian learned his sailing and seamanship from working fishermen and, and a straight stem converted oyster smack, a gaff rig catch with no engine, sailing in the North Sea and English Channel. He has cruised thousands of miles in Europe and the Mediterranean and has been sailing in California for over 45 years. And of course, many of you know him for his book uh, on the cruising guide of the Channel Islands. Please welcome Brian Fager. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What I'm going to do this evening is take you on a journey through the history of seafaring. This is going to be a global history. It's going to be superficial. It attempts to inform, entertain, amuse, and give you some food for thought. Because the history of seafaring on the open ocean goes back over 55,000 years. Not the thousand years or two thousand years of the Chumash tomorrow, much earlier than that. And what I want to show you are the details of some of these landmarks, which they really were. The important thing about all of this to know is that successful navigation and crossing oceans and going over the horizon depends on one thing and one thing alone, and that is your knowledge of the ocean. This is a lecture about the intimate knowledge of the ocean, and it contrasts with today where you press a button <laughs> and you know where you are within 30 <laughs> feet. But as I said to a gentleman at the back earlier, what happens if the machine doesn't work? There you are. No, I need just the one slide. This is a lecture, a talk about the ocean in many moods. It stems from a project I did some years ago, which involved a book on the history of seafaring, which was suggested by an editor of mine in New York. It took 10 years of extremely alcoholic lunches <laughs> to put the lecture together, the book together. I vividly remember in year nine, he looked over the table at the end of a bottle of very nice white wine and said, I've got it. And I said, what, a disease? And he said, no. The answer is to plug in your own personal experience of sailing into the story. And my God, it worked. Just like that, it clicked. So I wrote this book. But the first point I want to do is to introduce the whole issue of the knowledge of the ocean. Back in the 1880s, a Danish artist called Michael Anker painted a series of paintings of Danish fishermen who fished in the North Sea. These men fished in midwinter. They thought nothing of sitting round a stove down below, hove to under sail in a 40 to 50 knot gale, playing cards. <laughs> These were tough, unrelenting men. And I want you to look at their faces. I don't want you to say, good evening, how are you? I want you to look at the ocean, which is etched in their faces. These people knew the ocean intimately above the water and below. And here's another painting of his, 
which is a group of fishermen, and this place is called Skagen in northern Denmark, watching a trawler under sail in a gale. It's really blowing. And the question is, and that was the title of the picture, will he make it? Will he weather the point and get safely into harbor? Notice the expressions. Absolutely serious, no smiling, no excitement. They know the score. Because, and this is the first point I want to make in the whole of this lecture, for all the seamen I'm going to talk about here today, the ocean was etched into their faces. Look at their countenances. Let's go back and look at these gentlemen again. There wasn't much on the ocean they hadn't seen. And, ladies and gentlemen, they had an enormous respect for the ocean. And a lot of this talk is about respect. Because when you go to the islands here, you don't just press a button and turn right at the lights, which many people think you do. You judge very carefully the conditions, the sea, and the wind. Human exploration of open water goes back enormous distances into the past, about 55,000 years ago. And the first ocean going took place in tropical waters off Southeast Asia. Now, if you look at this here, you've got the mainland, which is up at the top. I'm having trouble getting my point. Oh, there it goes. OK, up here. What is not generally known is that during the height of the last ice age, only 15,000 years ago, the whole of this area between Vietnam and Timor was a continental shelf. Only 50 miles of water separated Australia from the Asian mainland and other islands. The sea was 300 feet lower than it is today here and also in the Santa Barbara Channel. It goes out about five miles here. But then there came a point when the seas rose and by about 6,000 years ago, sea levels were at their basic modern level. How then did people go on the ocean? There seemed to be two routes, one to the south through Bali and Timor, the other one through Borneo involving short distances. Now think for a moment about the Santa Barbara Channel. Look over at Santa Cruz. Now if you're not a sailor, you will think, whoopee, that is Santa Barbara, that is Santa Cruz Island. How pretty. Or we can see the island today. If you're a sailor, you will know that the highest point on the land will take you to Fry's Harbor. A low point will take you to Pelican Bay and prisoners. You will know the landmarks. It's called line of sight navigation. And the first navigation in ancient times was that of a line of sight from one island to the next. Almost certainly, they started with rafts and canoes which drifted downwind to islands they could see on the horizon. The point about this area, another point is, is firstly that it's warm, the waters are warm, the winds are very rarely strong, and for six months of the year they blow this way from the mainland out towards the islands, and then with the monsoon season, <coughs> excuse me, they go the other way. So you can go backwards and forwards. And one of the most important things to realize about early seafaring is that nobody ever went anywhere without knowing they could get back. <laughs> and one laughs, but it was terribly important. And this early thrust of navigation, which was mostly line of sight, took people out to what is called near Oceania. And they went out to places like the Bismarck Archipelago off New Guinea. There were people living on New Guinea by at least 45,000 years ago, and they were fishing. 
there were people living on the Solomon Islands here by at least 30,000. So you've got people here going out a long way in near Oceania. Then the moment of truth arrives. How do you go out of sight of land into remote Oceania? And it's very interesting that archaeology tells us there was a gap of about a thousand years before people went offshore. Now, let's look at this more closely. The important thing about the Southwest Pacific and an awful lot of these societies is that you can't live in isolation. You can't live in a fishing village in the Solomons without having contact with others because you need critical war materials. Maybe it's stone for making tools, fine-grained stone. Maybe it's grain. Maybe it's game meat. Maybe it's fish. Maybe it is prestigious ornaments. And it seems that a great deal of this early colonization of the extreme southwest was due to people simply exchanging goods over long distances by canoe. And we're very lucky that we do have some idea how this happened. Back in about the World War II period, one period, just after in the 20s, an anthropologist, he was a Pole, with the splendid name of Bronislaw Malinowski. I would kill to have a name like that. <laughs> Studied the people of the Trobian Islanders. And he discovered an extraordinary trade network which absolutely epitomizes what happened. It was called the Cooler Ring. And this was a highly ceremonial network of trade which exchanged from one hand to another strings of what you can only call heirloom beads. One type of bead went one way, another type went the other. It was a clockwise and counterclockwise move. Now, these strings of beads were exchanged between individuals. These individuals may not have known each other, but the prestige of being one of the members of the school of ring was extraordinary. But why would people do this? For one very simple reason, because it maintained contacts between extremely isolated communities. And these cooler events, which really were the background for enormous amounts of trade in all kinds of essential commodities, were basically a political and social mechanism for ensuring that people kept in touch. Because the secret of navigation in the Pacific very early on was the notion that you kept in contact with others if you were dealing with islands that are fairly close to one another. And then, after 1000 AD, they went on to Polynesia. How many of you have been to Tahiti? Ooh, a well-traveled group. How many of you want to go to Tahiti? <laughs> How did they do it? Why did they do it? And when did they do it? A three of the most fundamental questions about navigation. The answer is very simple. They knew the heavens and the earth and the oceans extremely well. If you sit in a modern fiberglass yacht, and you sail from here to Santa Cruz Island, and you may know where to go by looking at a landmark, or you may be a coward and use the buttons, which I know member of the, many members of the Santa Barbara Yacht Club do, <laughs> or you may rely on your knowledge of the ocean. Ladies and gentlemen, when you sail in a modern yacht, you're at least this amount from the ocean, three feet maybe, when you travel in a canoe, you're down there. 
and the ocean comes aboard. And the ocean isn't just a sea. It's waves. It's wind waves. It swells. And the people who navigated the water knew all the symbols of the water. For instance, they would know from the swells if they were approaching an island. They would know <coughs> from watching birds flying, land birds, how close they were to the coast, to a landfall. Because every island has a sort of radius of identification where you can tell. For example, many islands have waves and the waves bounce off the cliffs and you can feel the disturbance. And the people who did this learned their navigation from childhood. They were apprenticed to expert navigators. And they learned how to navigate by experience and oral tradition. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing like oral tradition and experience for navigating. What they learned from the age of seven or eight were the different trajectories of the stars in the heavens, of the moon and the sun. They learned the birds. They learned the different weather. They learned that, for example, you can go east when the trade winds drop. When the trade winds drop, Godzilla, El Nino, for example. And they navigated knowing they could go back. And they were so sensitized to the ocean that when they were approaching land, a navigator would go into the shelter in the middle of the cabin, in the middle of the canoe. He would lean over and he would sense, and I am not joking, the direction in which his testicles swung. <laughs> I knew you'd laugh, but they were so sensitized to the ocean, to their bodies, to the realities of the knowledge that they did it. And this has been documented very thoroughly. It was that level of knowledge which makes us look like amateurs. And the distances they traveled were amazing. The big thing they had to do was learn how to make overseas journeys for 300 miles or more. They got to Fiji, they paused there, then they went to Tonga. And the interesting thing was with this new, very sophisticated form of radiocarbon dating, we now know that people settled from the Society Islands, from Fiji out to the Society Islands, all the way out to Rapa Nui or Easter Island, and up to Hawaii, this is my only mention of Hawaii for the gentleman who's asking, in about two or three centuries. Ditto New Zealand. Why did they do it? Nobody really knows. One reason, almost certainly, were customs of inheritance, which saw inheritance being passed to the older son, whereas the younger sons had to find land. And on islands where land was in high demand for farming, they would, rather than fight, move out. And it seems a lot of this was due to an era of heroic navigation by major navigators, some of whom are still remembered in oral tradition. How many of you have been to Rapa Nui, Uistu Island? Any of you? Good. Isn't it fascinating? You've got these big moai, the ancestral figures. And this really epitomizes what all this is about. It's about relationships to the ocean, to the people who first came, to the ancestors of reaching out. Very, very, very sophisticated beliefs. And many of these beliefs revolved around fishing and around ancestors and about safe viging. One of the most striking things to me about early navigators was basically not only their knowledge, but how conservative they were. Very conservative, far more conservative than us. And we have all the weather forecasts in the world. 
Let's now take another example. What we've got so far is people using the stars, learning the heavenly bodies, knowing the ocean intimately, and traveling. Always traveling, no, they can come back. Let's look at another cradle of early fishing, of early navigation. The Aegean Sea. This is a boisterous ocean. It's the only ocean I've ever sailed in with when the wind blows, the waves come from four different directions at once. And you throw up. <laughs> the area I'm talking about particularly is here. The Aegean Sea where a number of things happened. There were lots of islands here. And again, you got line of sight navigation. And this was practiced very early on by the Mycenaeans. You see here two Mycenaean boats of about 1200 BC, somewhere around there, preserved on a wall painting on Santorini. Here, the winds were uncertain. When they blew strong, they blew. But if they didn't blow, you relied on oars. So a great deal of travel was by oar. But the important thing from our point of view is line of sight navigation again. There was nothing anyone who sailed this ocean didn't know about the moods of the ocean, the times to sail. For example, no one in their sane mind goes to Santa Cruz Island when Santa Ana's are forecast or happening. No one here, unless they were wise, uh, unwise, went out sailing in the winter. Because the important thing was that you had predictable winds and you had landmarks, natural and human. This is Sunion, a peninsula which leads into the strait that leads to Athens. And on top of it, is a temple to the sea god Poseidon. Brilliantly white columns which have become white because of the sea, the salt in the air. They glisten. If you go there and look at them closely, you can see the carving of the name of the poet Lord Byron on the columns. And the sunset from there is famous. But I vividly remember sailing in like this yacht did here once on a day when it wasn't particularly clear. There was a haze and I didn't know where we were. We didn't have GPS or anything like that. We were navigating by dead reckoning and by line of sight from an island called Kos over there. And we went in and I began to sweat. And then I remembered something an old skipper had told me. He said, look up because of this haze maybe you'll see things on higher ground. And there were the white columns of the temple of Poseidon. And I realized that the God was looking after me. You have these moments when you kind of link with people from the past. And really the Aegean is a classic example of sailing on line of sight. And this was something that happened very, very frequently because you have lots of islands, many of them interspersed by maybe 20 or 30 yards of water. The amount they started really sailing seriously at least 8,000 BC, much later than the Pacific, but by classical times it was really, really big. But by that time, and here I'm jumping a lot, in Northern Europe people were navigating the North Sea and the Channel. When I first came here back in the days of George Washington, <laughs> I was horrified to find that there were no sailing directions for this area for sailors. <coughs> Basically the philosophy was, as I said earlier, to turn right at the lights. In England, in Europe, in the North Sea and the Channel, you have sailing directions that tell you where you are within 20 yards and have dozens of buoys and markers that you have to learn because you're dealing with tides that run at six or seven knots and you're dealing with weather patterns which can be flat calm at 8 in the morning and blowing at 40 knots at 10 and then drop again to nothing at 1 o'clock. So this is very challenging water. 
And the question is, when did people in these very stormy waters first go on the open ocean? There is something psychologically difficult about looking out of the ocean, looking at the horizon where there's no land, and making yourself go over it, out of sight of land. This is very hard. I had terrible trouble the first two times I did it. And how did the English and the British and the Continentals do it? They did it because they knew there was land on the other side. Because there was constant contact. Again, you were talking about interaction. And some of the earliest are about 2000 BC, when people living in Northern Europe built planked canoes. This is a replica of one found partially in waterlogged conditions in Northeast England. It was made of several planks, rather low, with cross seats. And the planks were corked with moss and fiber. They made a replica some years ago at vast expense, using the traditional methods. It sank. <laughs> They've now refined it. But this boat was surprisingly seaworthy. Because the other thing, and we come to this with the Chumash tomorrow, is that these boats had very important symbolic significance. They were carrying not just loads, they were carrying people and gifts. You come back to the Kulavung where you've got people on the other side of the channel who were receiving, say, bronze bowls and exchanging them. Because this was the mechanism by which politically people connected so trade could take place. But then in due course, they brought in another boat the leather boat. The leather boat has a very long history. Think Eskimo umiaks, and you've got the general idea. Made of seal skin or cattle skin, they go back way into the first century BC. About the same time, a Roman trader, or Greek trader, sorry, from Marseille in southern France, traveled across France, took a leather boat in Brittany, traveled to Ireland, and is thought to have traveled as far north as Iceland. He wrote an account which is tantalizing incomplete. Boats with oars and a square sail. During the first century AD, Irish monks sailed these across to Iceland. These were very seaworthy, if slow, boats. Witness these examples from the 16th and 17th century in Ireland. Look at this example. That thing sailed, and notice the cow's horns on the bows. This thing sailed in rough water, and there's a magnificent account, which actually I quote in my book from a 19th century novelist who actually traveled in one of these in rough seas, and he was truly amazed. It survived. So a lot of early European trade was in leather boats. But again, the skills were terribly basic. Knowledge of the Asian knowledge of the coast, knowledge of the trade, of the tides, knowledge of what happened if the weather got really rough. But the boats that really define Europe, are boats were kind of milled, uh, what's called in Europe the clinker method, where you have overlapping planking. This is a model, a reconstruction of a funerary boat, which was used in eastern England in about 700 AD, to bury the body of a prominent Anglo-Saxon chief. Look at the double ends of the boat. High bows, a central mast. He was buried in a chamber with all his finery in the middle, and the boat was hauled inland up a hill and then buried under a mound. This is the famous Sutton Hoo ship. And you can see, if you go to England, the Sutton Hoo Museum is worth seeing. And certainly in the British Museum, you can see many of the artifacts. But the reason I mention this is because the tradition of high-ended boats in Europe is very, very long. And for this, we, of course, 
And this is a rock painting from Sweden. Thank the Norse or the Vikings. How many of you have seen Kirk Douglas in that movie called The Vikings? Oh, I got little people in the audience. It is, I weigh my words, one of the most bloody awful movies I've ever seen. <laughs> but it does feature Kirk Douglas with a bare chest. But that's the totally wrong picture of the Norse. And indeed, this picture is. Yes, the Norse were warriors. Yes, they were quarrelsome, fierce, and very ruthless raiders. But they were far more than that. They were traders and fishermen. And above all, they were traders. And the boat they used for trading was not the long, thin, fast, easily maneuverable warship. It was a boat called the Canar. And this is a merchant ship which is capable of carrying up to 20 tons of cargo. How do we know this? Because at Roskilde in Denmark, the Danes, or the Vikings, sank a series of boats to block a fjord for strategic reasons. And these have been excavated. And then they have built absolutely accurate replicas of them, like this one here. Seaworthy and Given their build, they have very flexible hulls, so in rough weather, they flex. So they're able to take very strong weather indeed. And it was in the, with these boats, not with warships, that the Norse traveled from Norway to England, to Iceland, to the Bay of Biscay, to Greenland, and eventually to Newfoundland, which they colonized, albeit briefly, always in the canal. How did they do it? They did it by a number of ways. First, they had absolutely unrivaled knowledge of the ocean and its moods. I once traveled in an 835-foot cruise ship from Iceland to Greenland. And I sat up in the top in the coffee bar drinking coffee, looking out at the ocean, and it was blowing 40 to 50 knots. Breakers, unrelenting cold. And I said to myself, one must remember that the Norse were out here in that weather. These were people who were tough, almost at an unimaginable level. The casualty rates must have been enormous. For example, in another context, we know of cod fishermen who went to Iceland after about 1415 in 60-foot boats, half open. They would fish in open water. When their hulls were full, they would come home, unload, and go back. The average trip, two months. The casualty rate of people wrecked on the Scottish coast coming home, 60%. Why did they do it? Because the market for fish to eat on holy days and Fridays was so lucrative that it paid off. So when I tell you about the ocean being etched into people's faces, that's what I mean. Look at another example. Am I boring you? No. Oh, okay. Anytime you want me to stop, just let me know. I am running on adrenaline. If you look at the Indian Ocean, it is an ineluctable fact that if you want to cross the ocean from the east to the west, say from East Africa to India, you can travel either this way or this way for six months of the year with the wind behind you. And then for the other six months, the wind blows in the opposite direction. The monsoon winds, first revealed to European sailors by a Greek navigator called Hippolus, who was in Alexandria. <laughs> 
and written about by a man who rejoiced in the magnificent name of Cosmos Indico Plustes. My wife keeps rabbits. I couldn't resist naming one of the rabbits Cosmos Indico Plustes. <laughs> and the way they did it was because in Africa there were war materials. There was gold. There was salt. There was iron. But above all, and this may seem strange because there's not much in the history, there were poles from mangrove swamps here, which were much in demand in what is now Saudi Arabia for house building. And this trade went up the coast or across in open water. And in recent times, it's been handled by a vessel called the Dao, which is still known. The Dao really came into Western consciousness thanks to an Australian historian and marine sailor called Alan Villiers, who back just before War II spent a year traveling in Arab Dao's from Kuwait. This is the one he traveled in with two miles. Look at the length of that yard. What he would do is travel, he did, he traveled this way in front of the wind, all the way here, all the way they stopped in the ports. He described how his captain had a wife in each port, down to here, and here in a estuary called the Rafiji, he harvested mangrove poles. Then he sailed back, and there's this marvelous description of how they sailed against the northeast monsoon up this coast, staying within a mile of the land, tacking in, tacking out, tacking in, tacking out. But the wind was never too strong. It was never too weak. They just kept going. And they did it because these people were consummate sailors with, again, an intimate knowledge of the ocean. And they knew every inch of the coast, the winds, everything. And they carried passengers who slept on deck. And there's this wonderful description in Alan Villiers of the last stage of the journey when they were going to his home port in Kuwait, the skipper's home port, of how he traveled in shallow water on strong winds with something like four or five feet under the keel at full speed in the shallows because he knew the water so well. It's this sense, because you can talk about sailors, and I aim this at people in the yacht club here. You can talk about people who go to the islands. You can talk about people who cross the Pacific, or go on that ghastly event called the Baha Ha Ha. But the main point is that ultimately, and these people knew it, any form of navigation comes down to judgment and experience and knowledge of the ocean. And I would say to many of us, and I'm one of them, we don't have nearly the knowledge of the ocean that our forebears had, and we should be ashamed of it. This nourished trade, which traveled far into the African interior to a great complex owned by chiefs about 500 years ago, you can just see it here, called Great Zimbabwe, there is the great enclosure. And many, many years ago, I was involved with an archaeological site 630 miles from the ocean in Central Africa on the Zambezi River, where we found a series of nine burials. This was one of them. This is a man of 28. Around his neck, he wore nine conus shells. These are shells, conical shells, you slice off the bottom. And in David Livingston's time in 1855, one of those shells was worth a large elephant tusk or two slaves. One of them was backed with an 18-carat gold cup. Around his neck were not only 18-carat gold beads, and the bead gold came from far inland, but also red, blue, and other colored Indian Ocean beads which had been traded from 
India and carried up in strings 600 miles from the ocean. Around his limbs were bangles of bronze and he wore a cotton garment, traces of which we found. He was of Islam. He had an Islamic amulet on his waist. 450 AD and that was 650 miles from the ocean and up at his head were a series of lengths of copper wire and a iron plate with holes in it where you would heat the wire and pull the copper when heated through the posts or the poles until it got narrower and narrower and finer and then they would wind it into these bangles this is extraordinary to find all this in one place but none of it would have been possible without the Indian Ocean trade on the one hand the Africans who were entrepreneurs who collected the seashells who facilitated the travel on the other hand the seamen from all over the Muslim and Indian world who crewed the Dallas. At Kilwa in Tanzania there's a fort built by an Arab sheik in about 1500. You can see it here surviving. And there were other visitors too. Believe it or not, and I apologize for this being a little faint, the Chinese. The Chinese mounted at the very end of the Han Dynasty a series of ex expeditions using large ships, very large ships, 300 foot long sailing vessels like junks. And they explored India, Southeast Asia, and came as far as Mecca and China. What were they doing? They weren't really exploring. They were indicating to foreign rulers that they owed the emperor tribute. And part of the tribute, in one case, or several cases, was giraffes. And giraffes from about 1000 AD entered the Chinese court. A little known fact. And the man who did all this was a remarkable, sorry, a remarkable eunuch, Zheng He, who was a very, very high powered courtier of the emperor who was charged with mounting a series of exhibitions, expeditions in large ships which carried thousands of people. And he traveled, it is thought, as far as East Africa. How do we know that? Because there were coins from archaeological sites which date to this particular period from China. So this was a very international world. And it was a world that was getting known better and better. And of course, it was the Portuguese under Vasco da Gama, there he is on the left, in 1497, who rounded the Cape. And here you can see the fort they built in Mombasa. And here is a group of people repairing a Dao sail. <coughs> so we're looking at European expansion. Now, the one thing I'm not going to do tonight is talk about galleons, warships, Nelson, that's old hat. What I'm talking about is the undercurrent where people really learnt how to navigate. And at this point, I'm going to take us to the Americas. That is a famous Edward Curtis picture of a northwest coast canoe. But where I want to start is the Aleutians. The Aleutian chain here supported some of the most fascinating seafaring and maritime societies on earth. So much so that when Russians arrived there on fur traders, they discovered that Aleutian canoes were far more efficient than their own wooden boats. Why? Because the Baidaka is a truly remarkable craft. Because it is a boat, and this is very important for the whole of this talk, which is perfectly adapted to local conditions. This boat, believe it or not, 
is built of the neck hide of the stellar sea lion. The framework being driftwood. This is an astoundingly seaworthy vessel. And the records from the Russians and later people of these things being caught out in gales and the canoes, two of them would laugh up together and become a raft. And the clothing they made, if you go to the, how many of you have been to the Anchorage Museum? Go. Did you see the Aleutian stuff? Oh, oh, my God. They made anoraks of bird intestines which would last a year. They were waterproof. And their equipment, every bit of it, was designed for a specific purpose, right down to the soles of their boots, which were made of stellar sea lion hide. The whole experience was people adapted perfectly to this water. And they did it to travel again between islands where they had to maintain contact, where social ties were important, and also to catch the halibut and the cod, which were their staple. They also used very sophisticated weaponry, including a toggle harpoon, which is hinged, and when it gets into the carcass of a sea lion, it stays there instead of coming out. These were very, very sophisticated fishermen. But none of what they could do was possible without knowing the ocean backwards. And these people had, I believe, 14 words to describe wave conditions alone, and something like 20 to describe different types of seaweed. These were people who lived completely in tune with the ocean. Most Aleutian men were on the water more or less permanently from about the age of eight. And some of them used to walk like this because they were so used to walk, living in canoes. And I talked to one guy up in Kodiak. There was a beach, an exposed beach with archaeological sites. And the swell was running on here in a northeast gale. And I said, would you come ashore in a Baidaka? And he looked at me as if I was nuts and he said, of course. But you choose your waves. So again, experience. And many of the boats up in the Aleutians, of course, with the Inuit and Eskimo, were the famous Umiaks, which are skin boats, like the Bronze Age boats from Europe, I told you. The disadvantage of these, they're excellent load carriers, is that if you get a headwind, they're very cumbersome. But again, adapted. Or in the Northwest, where you have these marvelous cedarwood canoes with high ends, which are capable of dealing with very deep water. And if you've been up the Inland Passage, which I'm sure many of you have been on a cruise to Alaska, yes. If you haven't, go. Because you go up the inland waters. And what you don't realize is that the Native Americans in ancient times <coughs> used to navigate from village to village up these channels. And these weren't just trips from one village to the next. They weren't just trade routes. <coughs> they were gossip columns. <laughs> People would stop and they would talk for hours. And what they were exchanging was information on fishing grounds, Information on quarrels and arguments, arranging marriages, trying to prevent feuds, exchanging goods, because the canoe was the vehicle for exchange and contact. But behind this again was an intimate knowledge of the ocean and of a society which had enormously complex relationships with the supernatural. This is an ancient Haida village from 1870s on Haida Gwaii, which is the Queen Charlotte Islands. And there's this bay called Nincent's. And at the back of this bay are the large number of weathering totem poles. And these totem poles have been controversy. Many of them in the 1950s were moved to the British Columbia Provincial Museum 
in Victoria, which incidentally, if you go to Victoria, is well worth seeing. But then there were others here. And the Native Americans and the conservation people have been in big arguments about this. Should these be preserved? Or should they be left in situ to revert to the forest from which they came? Because remember, as the Native Americans say, the ancestors who are commemorated on these ancestral poles came from the forest. And to the forest they should return. And return they will. And this is the point about so much of the sea mission. It is traditional knowledge that is pricelessly important. And nowhere do you see this more powerfully than in the case of the Chumash Tomol. The Chumash Tomol is a remarkable watercraft built of driftwood. The people who owned them were big, powerful men in Chumash society. They were people of influence. But the real importance of the Chumash Tomol was not the fact that they could cross to the islands, which they could do, but the casualty weights were enormous given their low freeboard and the often rough weather off the islands. It was the connections they maintained with other communities. There was a huge trade between Santa Cruz Island and the mainland in shell beads. Freshwater shells that were made into beads on the island and saltwater shells traded in strings across the mainland by the thousand. So many of them that they became a currency with fixed value. And these shells, beads, went all the way up to Oregon, deep into Nevada, and into the American Southwest. All because of the Tomal. So you've got to think in terms of ancient seafaring, of connections, of boats as vehicles to go from one place to another. And one of the most dramatic ones of these is the ancient Maya. I've almost finished. <laughs> the ancient Maya basically were not seafaring people. And here they called the ocean the Fare Pool. They used the conch shells from it as sacred trumpets. But there was one thing that goes on, and that was canoes. And the canoes were symbolic journeys through life. And here you see the maize god traveling on a canoe through life. Because canoes are a way of communicating and a way of traveling. But most remarkable of all is a long distance trade, which is thought to be actually have happened, between of all places, Ecuador and Central America, the Rio Bolsa area of Mexico. And this trade is thought, and it's very difficult to, to link this, it has to be done by metal analysis and so on, because the canoes have vanished. One of the great frustrations of studying early seafaring is the fact that canoes are organic and they vanish. They're not used anymore, they're beached and forgotten, and they rot away. But it's thought that people on balsa canoes travel from Ecuador, carrying, among other things, seashells, spondylus, sacred shells, all the way across here, taking about two months, it's fairly favorable weather, spending time here and then going back. And one of the things they brought with them, apparently, was a knowledge of metal, which was unknown in Mexico until these rafts, which look, think Tonkiti, Contiki, somewhat similar, arrived. Can we prove this? No. Does it look likely? Yes. So we come to my final argument. What I've shown you is a potpourri of different societies at a deliciously superficial level. I hope I haven't bored you. But what I've given you, I hope, is food for thought. Epitomized by this picture. This is a German cruise ship 
on the Elbe River in northern Germany in the 1910s, coal-fired. Very impressive. Look over here. These are fishermen. These people are fishing the same way as medieval fishermen fished, using knowledge passed from one generation to the other. Up the top here is a captain. He has compasses. He has sextants. He has leads and line. But he doesn't know the ocean nearly as well as these people in the fishing boats do who know the surface and the bottom. Why? Because they don't have engines. They are terrified of getting caught on a shore with the wind blowing onto the shore, a so-called lee shore. They are well aware of the penalties of making rash decisions in ways that boats like this wouldn't even think of. Ladies and gentlemen, the point I want to leave you with is in a way, as sailors, those of you who are in small boats, we're not here, although we have the technology and the number of people I know who sail, who face east, bow down and say, oh, I love my GPS. <laughs> the fact of the matter is if your GPS goes wrong, you're back where these guys were. And most of it was judgment. I vividly remember some years ago going to the west coast end of Santa Cruz with a guy who had GPS. And I was talking about it and I said, you know, whatever. And he said to me, how far away from the island? And I said, seven miles. Just looking. We were 17, 7.1 miles. <laughs> That's the point. It's experience. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not. Judgment, knowing the ocean, and never, never, never. And this is something our forebears really knew. Never take it for granted. By this point, I suspect you're getting a little sleepy. <laughs> this is this is Atticus Caticus Catamor Moose, <laughs> our man, Maine Coon Cat, who has got life wired. Thank you, and have a nice evening.